You are listening to the IoT for All Media Network. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the IoT for All podcast on the IoT for All Media Network. I'm your host, Ryan Chacon, one of the co-creators of IoT for All. Now, before we jump into this episode, please don't forget to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or join our newsletter at IoTforAll.com slash newsletter to catch all the newest episodes as soon as they come out. So without further ado, please enjoy this episode of the IoT for All podcast. Welcome, Ken, to the IoT for All podcast. How are things going on your end? Oh, great. You know, keeping busy, having fun. <laughs> yeah, this is a very exciting episode. This is episode 100 for the IoT for All podcast. Uh, we have two guests today. So you and then Eric Khan, who I'm going to introduce here in a second. But I wanted to bring you on first to introduce yourself to our audience, because not just are you a you know a guest on this episode, but you're also a newly added member to the IoT for All team. And um, in another exciting piece of news, we're going to be launching a new podcast on the IoT for All network that you're going to be the host of. So would you mind just giving a quick introduction about who you are, kind of you know what brought you to IoT for All, what you're going to be doing, and then quickly introduce the, the podcast and talk about the focus a little bit? Uh, happy to. Uh, I, uh, I do have to say, though, I, when you started to say Ken is, but also, I just want to say, <laughs> but also a client. That whole, that's all I can think about. So I'm, I'm going to start over here, but uh, <laughs> uh, uh, folks, uh, thank you for listening. Really appreciate it. I'm Ken Briota, I'm the new editorial director for IoT for All, and uh, I sort of come here through uh, uh, journalism and editorial and and marketing all the way down the line. And uh, I've been podcasting for a long time, and I'm really excited to sort of uh, bring this new podcast, Let's Connect, to the IoT for All Media Network. Uh, On this podcast, we're going to be talking about uh, how ecosystem players in IoT, technology thought leaders, and sort of all the innovators, you folks out there listening, uh, in IoT can sort of get a place and a platform to tell your stories, the things that you're working on. And and also, so when you're listening to these episodes, you get sort of an inside look at how technology strategy works, what are some areas that you should be thinking about innovating in. If you're uh, an implementation company or an end user company listening, then uh, maybe this is going to give you some tips on uh, on directions that make sense for your company and, and things in IoT that you weren't aware of. So the idea is to help uh, bring sort of the, the best practice in IoT implementation to uh, as broad an audience as we can manage. So, you know, all the rules like subscribe, rate, review, comment, all the, all the things that help us feed the algorithm so we can get as many earballs on these things as we can. Yeah. And um, a good follow up that I'll kind of add in here is I'm sure people are wondering, well, how will that change the IoT for all podcast? Since a lot of what you said is stuff we've been doing for the past, uh, you know, 100 or so episodes. And I think a good way to ex- explain it is that your show will be much more focused on connecting with the IoT ecosystem, you know, what's happening in the ecosystem, new offerings in the ecosystem, talking to more of those, um, those individuals and experts. And then the IoT for All podcast will kind of have a little bit of a broader reach, talking to companies maybe that are more the adopters of IoT and the journey they went through, the solutions that are out in the market for companies that are not in the IoT space to adopt, and just kind of offer that kind of advice to and education to those maybe earlier in their IoT journey and may not directly be connected to the IoT space or work and, and you know, live and breathe in it like like we do and you know your target um, target guests for your show. Yeah, uh, so we're going to be. I don't know about you, but I'm I'm really excited about this this concept of the uh, the I, IoT for all media network because now we're going to be able to sort of reach out to a lot of different audiences and over time, uh, maybe bring in additional shows and start syndicating them out and really trying to uh, make this a hub for the the IoT industry to go to listen to uh, their own stories and to, to learn from each other. Absolutely. Yeah, that expansion that we're hopefully do later on this year and bringing on some other popular podcasts to the network to kind of utilize the IoT for all engine to, to um, you know, gain attention and put more resources out in the world is going to be a fantastic thing that I absolutely am looking forward to. So let's go ahead and pivot here for a second. Let's bring in our our guest for today, Eric Kahn, the co-founder and CEO of Leverage. Eric, you want to go ahead and unmute yourself and join? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Thanks for having me, Ryan. I remember when you did your first podcast uh, approximately (laughs) two years ago. 
And uh, yeah. I have to admire you for your consistency and devotion to basically one podcast a week without fail for two straight years. So that's an amazing achievement. And I'm uh, really happy to be on for the, uh, the hundredth anniversary. Of your yeah. Thank you. It, it's, <laughs> it's, it's been an exciting journey. Um, a lot of people involved behind the scenes that, that have really made this possible. And, you know, a big shout out to our fantastic guests, you know, that were able to kind of, you know, put faith in, in the brand and in the podcast when it was getting started to help really kick it off to get it to where it is now and our ability to expand into two shows and potentially more going on. So, um, so I appreciate that. And it's great to have you on here. I think what would be nice is I know a lot of our audience is probably already familiar with leverage and what you all do, but let's start off by having you give a quick introduction just to who you are and then um, talk briefly about what leverage does and kind of your overall offering and approach to the market. Yeah, absolutely. So a little bit about me, I'm a software engineer slash math guy. Um, I've been in this tech space since I graduated from college quite a long time ago. Um, and Basically, for the last 25 years, I've been a serial entrepreneur. So when I uh, started working, I worked at a place called the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. We did a lot of basic research and the Internet was just sort of starting to come to be. Um, and it was really exciting. And I wanted to get out of research and more into product development and more into commercial type of uh, endeavors. So so I you know, joined a company, started a company with a couple other guys. None of us had actually done startups before. And we figured it out, though. And uh, bef you know, by the time we got done, it was very successful. And it was sold to uh, Raytheon, which is uh, one of the probably top three or four companies in the defense market. Um, and I haven't looked back since then. So um, I just love creating new products, looking at the white space and markets and solving problems with technology. Um, so that's that's essentially what drives me. Uh, leverage is uh, kind of a a joint offering from me and my one of my longtime best friends, Steve Lee, who's my co-founder and CTO. Um, we got together. Um, we had been working together in previous companies. And in uh, July of 2014, we decided, hey, it's a good time to start a new company. We both had uh, kind of breaks in the action of what we were doing at the time. And so we started that. We spent the first six months just figuring out, okay, what do we want to be when we be a, when we are a company and not just two guys hanging out for lunch? And uh, we uh, decided IoT was really buzzworthy. It uh, had all the ingredients, uh, something that was hard. There wasn't like a 800 pound gorilla, as they say, in the market. It was very uh, sort of fragmented, which meant that there's a lot of opportunity to solve problems and there wasn't a gigantic company already sort of owning the market. So it looked like a really good spot for us. We really enjoy technology. We have a lot of experience with wireless communications, hardware, cloud computing, you know, all the things that are ingredients of IoT. So, so we've been doing that basically since, uh, I guess, early 2015, uh, when we really started in full force and uh you know been having fun and growing the company since then so we've spoken to a lot of guests obviously that cover many different areas of, of iot and i'd be curious to kind of get your take on how you positioned leverage in the market to not just differentiate yourself from other companies but also kind of your overall <clears throat> kind of focus on helping companies adopt and implement iot and kind of you know what role do you all play. And, and what I'm getting at is having you kind of speak to those individuals who do not work in the IoT space, but are looking to get started on their journey. How would leverage play a role in that for them? Yeah, at its foundation, leverage is, is truly a software company. So we make a product that runs on top of your standard cloud providers like Google and Amazon um, and provides basic IoT services, which is still relatively abstract for somebody that doesn't know what IoT is. Um, but it, it's a value added layer very close to the end user um, that's very much needed and it's not really supplied by the big cloud companies. So we said we run on top of them. Uh, but what we found when we went to market when we first started is just trying to sell this abstract concept of an IoT platform uh, was a very tough sell. There's a you know tough sledding, a lot of education required. Customers didn't even know exactly what IoT meant because I mean it is a, a strange acronym, the Internet of Things. Um, what does that even mean, right? Um, so 
So we ended up um, sort of working backwards almost from the product to through a systems integration and ultimately to pilots. Because what we found now over doing the six years is pretty much every company goes through the same three phases. Um, they they want to do a pilot, a proof of concept, an MVP. They have different names for them um, and different goals. But they want to see, one, does the technology work? Does it provide some sort of ROI for their business? Because it's uh, at the end of the day, IoT is all about solving business problems or people problems um, with technology. So they want to understand how it works. So you have to do it. You have to train them up on a lot of the terminology. There's an incredible amount of technology involved uh, and you need to simplify it for them. And in some cases, abstract away a lot of the complexity so that they can really focus on their business. So we have a product that we call Jumpstart, which is kind of a productized service that we just go in very quickly and we can build, you know, gather requirements, figure out exactly what they want to do. What is the pain point they want to solve, deliver something and let them see it, touch it and feel it. It's not just a paper tiger. It's an actual system with hardware in the loop and they get to see it working in their business. If they like it, they see the value from it. Then they can move to phase two, which is we become their systems integrator, which, which before we started doing that and basically embracing becoming a systems integrator, we we're having a lot of problems of what I call cross, crossing the IoT chasm. So to go from a pilot to a scaled deployment across your enterprise is a really, really big jump. There are a lot of pieces involved. Uh, there's a lot of costs that you have to uh, uncover. There's a lot of operational friction. There's a lot of digital transformation within an organization, training of staff, you know, changing of processes. There's just so many things involved. And if you don't, if the customer doesn't have someone they can trust to help them, help guide them through that journey, they can kind of get lost or the pilot will just sort of go away. So as soon as we made the mental leap as a company to say, you know what, we're going to do essentially the dirty work, if you will. Uh, but it's rewarding too, because ultimately we get across the chasm. Uh, but until you do that for a customer and build that trust and really help them understand how they use this technology for the betterment of their business, they will never scale. So, so in essence, to summarize, what does leverage do? We provide a software product that enables the creation of low cost IoT solutions much more quickly than if you tried to do it all yourself. Uh, so it's a set of tools that you can leverage uh, just to build things more quickly and more inexpensively. And we provide the guidance that a customer needs, especially enterprise, because that's our main focus, to get that integrated into their business so they get the maximum value out of it. Fantastic. And um, speaking of kind of getting across that chasm into, you know, scale, can you share some of your more successful projects that have maybe gotten, you know, started out in the jumpstart phase, you know, moved into you becoming the systems integrator and helping them get to scale now? You don't have to share company names if you're not comfortable, but just just some more real life examples to kind of bring it full circle to to how you all are helping the market. Yeah, yeah. I'll talk about uh, one of them. It's, it's public, so it, there's no issues with disclosing it. But it, it's, you know, within the uh, what they call the LP WAN or low power wide area network uh, sub segment of IoT, just to add more buzzwords on top of buzzwords. Um, it's, it's, it's a very interesting use case that on its surface seems very simple. Um, but there's, there's a customer and we work with our partner Cox 2M. Uh, we have a close uh, relationship with Cox communications. Um, and they use our platform to solve problems for different industries. Uh, but one of the first ones that we did together was for Mannheim auto auctions. So, uh, if you're in the auto industry, you know, you know who Mannheim is. They're, they're the largest sort of supplier of used cars in the US and potentially the world, but definitely in the US. Uh, the stat that I've heard is three out of every four cars that is sold in a used capacity in the United States touches a Mannheim lot at some point in its life. So that's, that's an amazing amount of cars when you think Prior to the pandemic, the U.S. was maybe selling 18 million cars a year, somewhere in that range. To have you know 12 million of them go through a Mannheim uh, as they you know, can convert from leases or are resold, um, it's a lot of volume. There's a lot of cars. The fundamental problem that business had was they would have these large parking lots with tens of thousands of vehicles on them, and they would need to get all of these. You know, they'd have to orchestrate 
to get thousands, just a subset of the tens of thousands, get thousands of very specific ones in a certain order for a live auction that happens in very quickly. It's both live with people there as well as online and cars come through, there's cameras, there's sort of barkers. It's everything you would think about when there's an auction. And if you can't get the cars lined up, if you can't find them on the parking lots, it's a real problem. You can't sell cars and cars are a depreciating asset. So every month a car's value goes down. So if you can't get the cars, move them and sell them, resell them, um, you're, you're losing money every day. So Mannheim had been trying for years, I think maybe even a decade to essentially put low cost GPS trackers on these cars that are battery powered, that would last for multiple years and be very inexpensive so they could see where all their cars were on the parking lot. When I first heard about this use case, I thought, well, that's really simple. Like we've all had GPS on our phones forever. But when you think through it, the requirements there make it way more difficult because you're talking about your phone, you as a human, you're the custodian of your phone. You charge it. You make sure it's charged. Well, a, a, a little tracker that's just thrown into a car, who's, who's watching over it? No one. So you, you have to track the trackers. You have to know their battery states. They have The batteries have to last a really long time to get the value. Um, and that's essentially the solution we built. Uh, it's, called, it's a Cox 2M product that uses a leverage platform underneath, but it's called Lot Vision. And that same product has now been sort of genericized and has been applied to multiple types of industries where you have lots of things on parking lots or in buildings that you just need to find them and sort them and understand their, their condition. So that's been a very successful thing. I think Mannheim at this point is closing into 400 or 500,000 vehicles or travel their, uh, tracking at any one time. And it uses a niche but growing technology called LoRa uh, from a networking wireless standpoint to be able to transmit the data because it's very friendly on battery life um, and other things like that. That's awesome. Um, and before we bring Ken back in, I want to ask is, is the way you work with Cox 2M as far as um, kind of having your technology being the underlying platform, but they are in a sense, the ones selling it and operating it under their name, kind of like basically a white label solution. Is that how you often work with most companies that you have as clients or is there kind of a mix uh, with how that's handled? Yeah, It's generally one of two ways. Uh, when you get to, to the scale side of things, we either sell it like a platform as a service where in the, and that's kind of the case with Cox 2M at this point, where initially they they had us as their outsourced product team and we did everything, basically built okay. all the applications. But as they've evolved as a business and they've grown their team, they now have their own developers. They have their own product people. They have, they've basically replaced us, all the systems integration activities we used to do on their behalf. They've replaced them with their own people, which is perfect for them and perfect for us because we just want to be the platform company anyway. So in that okay. case, we sell it platform as a service. They, they modify it. They customize it. They, they then resell it under the Cox 2M brand. And that works out great. We also have a subset of customers that I would, I would label more as software as a service where, where solution as a service is probably more appropriate where we are kind of the lead systems integrator and we provide a solution at a fixed cost to a customer. And it's much more of a black box for the end customer. They don't necessarily know nor care how it works, like what are the different components, where the hardware came from, what communications protocols it uses. They just want to know that it can solve a business problem at a certain cost. And they want to know what that cost is. They want it to be very transparent. So that's the other segment of our business, essentially the SaaS business, where we'll have a solution, we sell it into a customer and they just use it. And we provide sort of 100% care and feeding and a service level agreement for that, that product right. or solution. Okay. Awesome. Um, so what I would like to do now that we've kind of learned not just about Eric, but also leverage and what y'all are doing, I, I was thinking it'd be a fun kind of pro or game to kind of go through some of the most commonly asked questions or commonly discussed topics in the first hundred episodes and bring Ken back in mm -hmm. and have kind of pose these questions out for you know Ken and Eric to kind of talk back and forth about and uh, uh, spend the rest of our time together kind of going through some of these higher level questions that I think got a lot of engagement early on last year and could definitely use some revisiting going into um, into this new year and what we can you know talking around what we expect the IOT space to look like in 2020 
2021. So with that being said, the first question I have for you all is around kind of the IoT journey. I guess the first couple questions are around the IoT journey that companies embark on um, once they kind of understand what IoT is and the value it provides to their business. So um, starting with Eric, what advice do you have for companies who are looking to get started on their IoT journey? These are companies who understand what IoT can do for their business, have internal you know, buy-in, have some budget, and are really looking to begin. So where would you recommend they start and, and what should they be thinking about as they you know, kind of embark on this IoT journey? Um, you know, what I think the best place to start would be with a, it could be a company like Leverage or a a systems integrator of some sort. And the reason I say that is they not only have knowledge of the market and the ecosystem and all the different technologies involved, but they have also built systems. So they so they have not just they've read about it, um, but they've actually practiced it. Um, and so I think you have a better chance of success if you can identify a systems integrator to kind of help you and they can kind of do consulting in a way, but they're, but they're actually building things and showing you things instead of just providing view graphs, they're actually testing it in the context of your business. And so, and so only companies that have a native ability to create products and write software or, you know, work with hardware vendors and integrate things are going to be able to do that and give you the confidence as a business to move forward beyond that. So that would be kind of the first place I'd start. But even before that, (laughs) I would make sure that as a business, you've really done your homework on your own pain point. Like what is the thing you're trying to solve and how much is that worth to you? Probably the biggest um, impediment uh, for all of us in on both sides of the buyer and seller's market is a customer that doesn't know what the solution has to provide for them, either from a requirement standpoint or doesn't know what the value is. So, you know, if, so if you're a business, like if you're a Mannheim to go back to that example, you essentially run this if then else statement in your head, you're like, if I could eliminate, you know, if I could know where all my cars are instantly in the palm of my hand, what would that do to my business? How would that save me money? How would it improve my customer experience? Would it allow me more revenue opportunities? And kind of thinking through that purely at, at the business level first, don't forget about how it might get done, but like, what are you, and what would be the value of that? You know, is it, is it really reducing manpower, getting rid of really bad jobs where you have high turnover and low quality and replacing it with higher, higher level jobs that are better paying for people, um, just providing higher customer experience. Maybe it's a competitive advantage in your market. Really thinking through that, that would be the very first step I would, I would do. And that can be all done somewhat internally because every business knows their business really well. So I would start there. Next step, I would try to find either a larger systems integrator or a smaller niche one like, like we do. We provide those services in the area that we focus on and, and kind of work with them and do a little, you know, build a little test a little and get feedback and then go from there. I would, uh, I'd step us back even one more and I'd be terribly remiss if I didn't say you should start by reading uh, on IoT for all <laughs> and uh, taking a look at some education on what the IoT is all about. Absolutely. And if you're not plugging, are you even podcasting? Come on. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Ken, Ken, to some of Eric's points, I feel like, um, uh, you know, the education piece is super important. And and obviously, we started IoT for All with the idea of helping educate the market so that we could help adoption across the industry. Because there are different, different or a lot of different components of an IoT solution. Everything from, you know, the hardware, the connectivity to software, you know, you can keep going. Um and Eric made a good point of, of he recommends starting with a systems integrator. And I think honestly, even if leverage didn't play that role, he'd probably still suggest that because we've seen talking with hardware companies and connectivity companies that it's not bad to go down, you know, start with talking to them. But what they're going to do is bring in somebody who really understands the end to end solution, even if that company doesn't provide those services internally, which really hits at uh, the, uh, one of the key elements of the makeup of the IT ecosystem, which is partnerships. Yeah. And from your discussions with with, with experts and guests from your past podcast that you've already been recording for the new podcast, what has been kind of the overall, I guess, thought process and and value f- that they see in in a strong partnership ecosystem that each company kind of has? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't think you could 
have been more right in saying that that sort of the partnership economy is critical to IoT and and the growth of the industry. I think uh, mainly because uh, no one company or provider or is anybody really can or should be the the be all and end all. There's no sort of Walmart for IoT. I think that that the more specialized and, and expert uh, a company is, the better they are at that thing. And IoT is really complex, and and there's a lot of different moving parts in any sort of uh, system uh, or IoT solution. So working with the right partners is how you get the expertise across the system that you need. Now, uh, sometimes there's a uh, sort of pyramid of partners. You've got your your SI partner who then works with a bunch of other tiers of partners. That's often how it works. But um, if you're just starting out or even if you've been uh, implementing IoT for a while and you're looking at a new avenue, creating a new profit center, doing some other thing, there is an expert partner out there that will be who you should work with. And so I think that the the research around finding those experts is critical uh as an early step and um there's a it's actually that's actually a really high bar it's hard to find those those uh those experts and those those companies that can do the thing you need so finding uh finding the right partners probably couldn't be more important i think yeah and and eric kind of elaborate on that what are your thoughts on kind of the vetting process that non iot companies should could it, how they should approach that process when they're looking for the right company to work with. Cause there's tons of platforms out there. There's tons of hardware manufacturers and SIs. How do you recommend or like what kind of questions should they be asking or, you know, what things should they be looking for? And then on the opposite side, maybe what are the, the red flags that they should be avoiding if they come across a potential kind of lead partner for them uh, during that process? No, I, I think, you know, at, at the end of the day, every business that's buying something wants to buy something that's, open at some level, right? So, so if, you know, and secure, like security and openness are probably one of the top two things that a buyer should be thinking about is, and when I say openness, it's the ability to change uh, whatever you're doing in the future, you know, giving yourself options as a business and not getting tied a hundred percent into any particular sort of single thread thread and encounter so that you have optionality because your business will change. You don't know your partner's business could change. Uh, and you know, the days of vendor lock-in, um, they, they've never been very popular. There's advantages to vendor lock-in because if you're a vendor, like you're an Amazon, for instance, right? The Amazon is kind of does almost everything these days and they do what they offer a lot of services in IOT, but they also, you know, one of the downsides of, using Amazon for everything, for instance, is now you're, you're really, really beholden to Amazon. So if they change their products, if they increase their prices, if, they, if new technology comes in that wasn't invented at Amazon, you can't necessarily get at it and use it. So, so you have to kind of thread the needle there. As I said, there are, there are advantages to, you know, single sourcing in some cases, but I think the, the disadvantages outweigh it. And so looking for something that's open, a, a company that's approaches things in an open way, um, so that, you know, you're trying to use open source, you're using, you know, processes and tools and all the things that like the rest of the world is, is settling on and it's changing all the time and the ability to change going forward and kind of future proofing your decisions is really important. And the se second aspect, which is really probably the top thing that most buyers think about is security, right? So okay. I mean, right. security now is probably more important than it's ever been just because we're all working remote the pandemic, right? So we're all physically not present in our offices, at our job sites. We're doing everything over the internet, basically. Um, and so if you don't have a secure connection and you, you can't physically be there to mind your devices, you know, somebody could be out there, say you're uh, monitoring an oil rig and you don't have anybody out there because there's COVID shutdown. Well, somebody could just walk in there and, you know, start physically manipulating devices, moving them around, doing different things to them, injecting different types of firmware into them. So you have to be very, very vigilant from the physical device all the way through all the layers that we hear about, you know, with ransomware and stuff on the cloud that you hear about that all the time. But IoT, it's even more important because you're talking about things that are out in the wild that other people 
bad actors can potentially physically interact with, that's that's a higher order of security need. So, so security and openness are the two big things that I would look at as a buyer. But I, but I you know going back to what what you and Ken were just talking about, like resources like IoT for all are so important, and they are the first place you should start. Um, you know is is really reading and it's kind of you know the same thing for everything you have to you can only get a balanced opinion and kind of get a vector on what you should who you should be talking who are the players in the industry what are the general technologies you may not understand all of it but getting like a working knowledge of of things um is really important before you even start reaching out so you're not just like picking something that showed up in a google adwords ad like i'm just going to use them right so um education is so important in IoT because it is so complex and there are so many moving parts to it and so much specialization um, that that that's really you know you you can't you can't ever read enough basically uh, to try to stay up on what the latest trends are and the latest technologies that are coming in that can affect how you even do an implementation. So, so let me throw another question back at you. Um, it's from my experience talking with a lot of different guests and just companies in general, especially the companies that don't work in IoT, they're looking for a solution. Oftentimes, once they do that education process, they've reached out to a company to start working with. One of the first questions they ask is around the business model and how this, how they, you know, the business model is not just on through the relationship with that company, let's say an SI in this instance, but if they build a solution then for their, um, for a customer, there's a business model attached to that end as well. When, from your experience, what are like the top couple business models that companies are kind of more like, leaning to engaging with when it comes to working with a company. I mean, I know we, there's a number we could kind of go into and you can get as creative as you want, but from your experience, where does the business model kind of conversation take itself once that it kind of begins? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So, um, and a lot of times a business will start with one model and switch to a different model along the way as they get more educated and they can bring some to the Cox 2M is a perfect example, right? You start with essentially outsourcing most, most of the things to leverage, but ultimately you grow your own team and you start insourcing it back and you just ultimately just use the software that we provide as, as a platform license. Right. Um, so what I, what I, the way I kind of, characterize the the general organizational or engagement model is is three it's it's always you know pretty much the answer for anything is like three right there's two extremes and then the thing in the middle that's a hybrid uh, so um, so the what i call them are the turnkey solution model and so what i would recommend that for are businesses that really are not not in their heart technology companies at all you know, they don't understand software development. They don't understand hardware. They're not a wireless community. They're just users of all this stuff, but they have no innate ability to objectively look at something and say, that's good software or bad software, or that's hard to build or easy to build. Like they just don't have the ability to know that, um, but they know their business really well. So in that case, I, I think if they find the right partner, you know, they still should go through the prototyping and the integration and all that stuff to prove out the solution works for their business. But a turnkey solution model, as I call it, I think is the perfect one. That's kind of you buy a solution as a service. It gets customized for your business. Maybe get your logo on it. It's integrated into the systems you are currently using as a business. But ultimately, you basically have one company. It's providing the solution, it, ha it probably has a bunch of other partners underneath it that are subcontracting or partners at some level providing hardware or cellular connectivity or whatever it may be. But ultimately, that customer doesn't care about that. They only have one contract. They have with the prime contract, if you will. And they just want the solution to work. Once it's integrated with their system, they pay a... F it's, it's usually based on this. Every one of these are based on some sort of consumption model these days. So you, you pay, pay as you go, pay as much as you use kind of thing. Um, and you get a service level agreement because it becomes integral to your business. And it, it really can't go down for any significant amount of time. Once it's integrated, it's part of how you operate. So... Um, that's that's kind of on the hands-off approach. And that's great for companies coming really from the other side of the field from a technology company. Um, the other side is kind of the Cox 2M model, right? So Cox, Cox Communications, they are a technology company. They're, under, they're, they're familiar with technology, especially wireless technology. Um, they've built software. They've built hardware. They are, they're not an Amazon, but they're certainly not a um, 
company that just makes windows and doors or tires or something, right? Like, so they're a technology company. Um, so in that case, they have, they have an understanding and innate understanding as part of their business to be a technology company. So they can adopt more of a platform model where they essentially just use basic tools. They could even go directly if they wanted to and not even use a company like Leverage, just build, write their own software on top of a cloud provider and just work it from the ground up. Um, so that's that. And then there's this kind of blended solution. The blended solution model is where the customer and we'll say the prime contractor, whoever's responsible for the solution, they sort of like horse trade um, a, basically and say, okay, you do tier one support. Um, you pay for the cloud bill. So you understand the consumption on you know, the cloud spend, but we'll take care of writing the software for you. We'll do the QA, you know, we'll do those kind of, we'll do monitoring 24 seven. So, so you kind of break this, the overall solution into different pieces and you say, who's going to be the owner and the primary one responsible. So in that case, the customer doesn't have to do everything. They don't have to be a technology company, but they actually understand a lot more how it works and, and they feel like they have more control and then they can go up or down from this kind of middle, middle level to either writing a lot more software, taking a lot more ownership, maybe even buying all of the fundamental components and owning it outright if they really wanted to, or they can go up the other way and say, you know, this is a lot more work than I thought. Um, you know, my IT department was already screaming at me before you did this. And, uh, now, now they're about to kill me. So we want to, we want to sort of back off and just let you take everything and give us a white glove service. And that's more the solution, turnkey solution model. So that's kind of the, you know, the three models that generally work. Now, when it comes to the solution as a service kind of approach is, does that simplify the buying process for the, for the customer? Basically what I mean by that is if you're doing your research and you're, you're understanding that there's a hardware component, a connectivity, a component, a software and cloud component, you know, et cetera, et cetera. You're, you're thinking about, man, I have to now figure out uh, a relationship with hardware company to figure out pricing there. I have to then negotiate connectivity costs and handle that as an expense. And then also the cloud bill and the, the you know, the software development for the actual solution and, and the UI, like, is that kind of the approach you recommend it for to, to not have to worry so much about that? And it can all be an all in baked in cost that is just, you know, they're paying monthly or de per device or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, you know, it ultimately comes down. That's why I was harping on like business value. Like they once the, the end user knows the value. And if you can, you know, you, if you're going to be a successful seller in IOT, you have to line whatever your pricing is to the value they need it to be right. Otherwise the math doesn't work and they will never scale. They'll just do a pilot and they'll go, this is great. It actually solved the problem technically. But when I run the cost and I run my spreadsheet, my CFO is telling me this is going to cost us twice as much. It would cost us if I just had people do it. Right. So, so, you know, clearly that's not going to go through the organization. So, so you really price it on value. Um, business models that are starting to emerge now as you get the IoT get, system gets a little more mature um, are things where you're aligning basically your your success as an IoT solution provider, like say a leverage, for instance, in our niche. You would basically say, we'll take a percentage of how much money we save you. Um, so if this solution, if you know this solution, just to pick a you know, round number, is going to save you a million dollars a year, the contract's written to say, it, as long as you can figure out how to measure it, and that's the tough part here. But if you can measure it, if you can say, you know, if, if, if I could sign up a contract with someone and said, hey, we're going to save you a million dollars a year and we get to split that 50-50 with you. And if we could both look at that and objectively look at that data and say, yes, it did save you a million dollars, that company that we're selling to, our customer would be more than happy to pay us half of that because they just, they did, had no risk and they just saved half a million dollars a year, right? So, so those kind of mutual alignments, if you can really determine by value how much you can save, but that goes back to the business that have, they have to do their homework. They have to know what their true costs are if they eliminate things or change things. Right. And so, so that's another way to do, do this. Great. Well, let's, um, that's been, that's fantastic advice. I think a lot of, a lot of very relevant points there that a lot of our audience can appreciate. Uh, I want to pivot quickly uh, into kind of more general topics and just get your take, uh, kind of rapid fire questions here. I'll start with Ken and then Eric, please feel free to add on to anything Ken, um, um, or any different, I guess, opinion or thoughts from what Ken shares, but 
obviously we all know of IoT. We've we've heard this new phrase coming out, AIoT. So the kind of the mixture of AI and IoT, which we're seeing now. Um, can I love to just just your view on kind of the the role AI is playing in the IoT space um, and how it's kind of contributing to just overall kind of efficiency, adoption, and so forth. Sure, uh, this is great because I'll start with a hot take. There's no such thing as AI. Artificial intelligence doesn't exist. Uh, Basically, it's it's. A really cool name, uh, and it, I prefer to think of it as uh, automated intelligence. The role of AI in IoT or the AIoT is to take the the data that's collected via sensors and run them through statistical analysis algorithms to then produce the outcomes that you need to make your strategic decision making happen or your automation happen if you're in uh, uh, highly automated environments or uh, environments that you're trying to make automated. It's a, another really useful and close to inevitable tool uh, for any IoT implementation to be thinking about. Uh, I think that it um, it has a lot of secondary benefits, especially in terms of uh, using human resources in more effective ways to create more efficiency and and additional profit centers in a business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's a good way to look at it. You know, I, I actually, my master's degree, my focus of my master's degree was artificial intelligence and it was really big back then too. Uh, <laughs> so, so this term has been around for a long time. Um, but, uh, yeah, ultimately AI is math, right? <laughs> so <laughs> it's essentially running a whole bunch of algorithms. And these days because of cloud computing and nano computing and just all kinds of just, you know, Moore's law type of things, you can just do more faster and better and more complexity in shorter periods of time. And so therefore you can do a lot more what if type statements, you can do a lot more recursion, a lot more sophisticated statistical analysis and A, B, C, D, E, F, G testing of all that in real time, right? So AI, you know, at, at the end of the day, IoT's primary job is to feed data to AI because AI is only as good as the data it's given. And the larger the quantity of data, the better the AI algorithms can get at determining whatever the insight is or the outcome or the automation or whatever it is, right? So the more data you have, the more normalized the results, the less outliers, the more it's filtered, the more exact it, it sort of becomes. Um, so, so the way, the reason AI OT is becoming a thing is because they are basically like peanut butter and jelly. Uh, you know, without um, AI obviously exists without IoT scaling to like trillions of devices because every one of us has a cell phone and a computer and other things and we're already feeding data. It's a lot of it's human derived data, but we're already feeding it in the cloud. So there's billions of data points every second going up there that you can run algorithms on. But the exciting part for IoT is you can have $10. $5, $1 sensors feeding very small amounts of data, but have trillions of these things. <laughs> and, uh, you know, imagine if you're, ha imagine if, if you could track, if you could know the condition and the location within inches of every single thing in your house, and you could do that at a cost that was affordable, who wouldn't do that? Like you, you would do it, right? Like if I could know right now where anything is I could think of, if I could Google search essentially anything in my house and just get it, that would be that'd be marvelous, right? I'd never lose anything in my house again. Everyone would want that. Well, what's what stops that from doing that? Well, there's a technology curve to get it, the batteries and things like that. But ultimately, it's a cost thing. Uh, it's a cost and a form factor thing. So as everything gets cheaper, smaller, more efficient, battery technology gets better. You're you're going to be able to put sensors affordably on everything, um, and so that sheer amount of data that you're getting from basically metricing every single thing on the planet is going to have a major impact in increasing these AI algorithms' ability to determine all kinds of stuff. So you get sort of these second order effects. For the record, and I'm gonna I might take us down a little bit of a garden path here, Ryan. So I apologize. Um, <laughs> what I, I'm curious, Eric, about what your thoughts are in those sort of scenarios where some people are saying rather than putting a sensor on every object, you use one sort of 
smarter sensor, like a, a video camera that can recognize objects to then sense a lot of things at once. And that that's one way to make that more cost effective. I kind of find that exciting, but I think it introduces uh, some security issues and some other type of issues that need to be addressed before it works. I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Video always gets uh, people in trouble. <laughs> like, like, sensors don't mind being videoed. People do though. Sure. Uh, so, um, yeah, it's probably a hybrid, right? You, you know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of pushing things to the extreme, you know, and just saying, hey, this one type of way to detect things, right, through a very inexpensive sensor. But yes, you could. Yeah, you know, I mean, there, I mean, I, I just got a Tesla this year, which is, <laughs> it, I, I don't even call it a car. It's like a phone that that rolls down the road and does cool stuff. What um, phone? I, I <laughs> yeah, it's just a gigantic smartphone, basically, um, that conveys me physically around the world. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's, it's really amazing to see, you know, kind of where this can go. It has LIDAR, it has HD cameras everywhere, right? So, so yeah, cameras, computer vision, you could start doing things where you don't have to physically touch it, but you can detect it through radar, detect it through, you know, regular video and pictures and things. So there's, there's lots of different ways to solve the problem. But I think the fundamentally going back to like, what is the pain point? The pain point is you'd love to know where everything in your house is wherever it has located. So, um, you know, it's probably a combination, just like IT is, there's a lot of combinatorics there. And that's why you need, uh, going back, rolling back up to my systems integrator kind of pitch, uh, you need someone that understands all the different options to say what is the best. Because a lot of times, just like when you write code, like, which I used to do a lot of when I was younger, there are, there are a dozen ways to solve a problem. Some of them are much better than others, though. Uh, and so it's uncovering the ones that are the better way or the more elegant way or the, the more you know, effective way to, to solve something. I'm looking forward to uh, sort of the traveling SI, like a, a, a your neighborhood plumber or electrician. You've also got the phone number of your neighborhood uh, systems integrator who comes by and fixes. I can't find the thing that does all of my laundry maintenance <laughs> yeah, that's that's you know, and there's a big philosophic debate, and I you know, you can argue both sides of it, but like, does automation is it going to cause you know reduce jobs? So ultimately, at the final, you know, if you take it to its ultimate conclusion, there's one person like a Jeff Bezos that runs everything, and everyone else is out of work mm -hmm. because everything's automated. I don't think we'll ever that'll ever happen. Like, nope. there's always we're just creating new jobs, and we're creating the the new skills gaps that everyone's just going to keep continually getting educated, more specialized. And so I, I think people always have plenty of work to do. The nature of that work though, and the ability to learn is going to be increasingly important in the modern world. You need to be a, and not in a formal setting, like in a completely informal setting. If you can't just learn new things, whatever they are, <laughs> You're, you're going to be left behind. So, so focusing on education and teaching kids how to learn quickly um, is going to be really important for the future world we're all sort of going towards. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, speaking of kind of the future world, there's been a topic that's been on the minds of, or I guess out in the market and is kind of slowly getting into our life, especially through our cell phones, which is 5G. Um, for years leading up to this, everybody's kind of said there's a lot of hype, but nothing really um, kind of really you know valuable coming out of it just yet. It seems like it's now hitting more mainstream with the new iPhone and then additional smartphones in the market. But I wanted to get your take as far as 2021 goes and how you see 5G kind of playing a role in the IoT space um, and then how that relates also to other connectivity that we've seen success in like LP WAN technologies and so forth. Do you, you, I, I like Ken go first. I, I feel like I just uh, monopolized a lot of words there. So, uh. <laughs> all right. Um, Ryan, you keep, you keep jumping into my hot take areas, which I appreciate. Uh, I once moderated a, a session at an event uh, that was called uh, 5G is bold changed my mind and uh, <laughs> uh and uh uh my mind has largely been changed since then but uh i think that the the main impact that we're seeing with sort of 5g in the consumer and commercial space is just going to be in terms of of more facility of use you know i think consumers are gonna are gonna be excited about you know better video quality and and things like that where it's available on the the iot side and the enterprise and the industrial iot i think that um 
the the main impacts are going to be in the the most secure and uh, uh, sort of command and control areas, places where millisecond latency matters. So I'm talking about fully automated transportation. Uh, I'm talking about um, uh, critical infrastructure, places where if there's a fault, it, then a millisecond later, there can be disaster, things like that. I think that's where you're going to find your most common use cases, at least for the the medium term. You know, maybe over time it becomes everybody just uses it because it's the thing. But I think that, that that's going to happen first. Although it's also super interesting to look at like the CBRS bands, because I think that there's more sort of wide uh, applications there. And uh, that m- technically, I think, also counts as 5G. So I think there's some, some more interesting things that are happening there, too. Yeah, yeah. The uh, the thing that, uh, you know, maybe uh, the general public kind of misses with 5G because it's always been advertised as just more bandwidth, a gigabit, a gigabit of bandwidth to your phone. And that's great. Like everyone will take more bandwidth, you know, more disk space, more disk space, more cowbell. Right. Uh, everybody wants more of everything. But the, the thing that's really going to have the biggest impact is is really this uh, latency that Ken mentioned. Right. So so why does latency and what is latency? <laughs> latency is basically the time it takes for you to th- either think to do something or press a button till the time it happens, right? So the time you detect something to the time you can operate on that detection, that's kind of your lag time or your latency. So if you can, if you can drive that down to zero, then essentially you can remotely operate anything from anywhere in the world other than the speed of light type issues, <laughs> which, you know, if we're getting into that kind of thing, I think it's probably beyond the level of this podcast, but <laughs> can we talk about quantum computing? We, we could be real. That could be, that could be another whole thing. We could, I'll have to do a little more research on it, but uh, that's probably cool. better for Ken's new show. Yeah, I, I think, think so, sure. <laughs> but if, if you can, if you can essentially have guaranteed low latency and that, and the other part is guaranteed. So, Variance in latency is just as bad as 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 a high latency, right? If if it's if it's one millisecond now, but you do it again, and it's five milliseconds. That you can't do things like robotic surgery, uh, remote surgery. You can't operate an autonomous vehicle if a pedestrian is walking in front of it, and most of the time it stops. But sometimes, yeah, you know, if the sun's at a certain angle, maybe it doesn't stop and it runs over a person. Like that's just not that's not cool, right? So part of the slogan: we probably won't run you over. We probably won't hit you, right? Um, uh, but yeah, that, I mean, it, it's all probability. But that's that's one of the huge things of five G, and also a kind of an overlooked thing. And again, five G is it's probably more overloaded than even IoT is at this point. Like, what does it mean? It's this incredibly complex modem that just can do all these different bands simultaneously and send data and receive data um, at, at its base thing. But they're even, you know, everyone thinks of 5G as high bandwidth stuff, low latency, high bandwidth. But there's also a whole element of classified under 5G. I've heard these days that it's just low bandwidth, but very inexpensive connectivity. And that's for that's in the area that we focus at leverage, which is what this, this low power wide area. So on the cellular side, there's two sort of standards that have emerged, LTE dash M, which was mobile a version of that. And then there's uh, NB-IoT or narrowband IoT. So those essentially are also bundled in with 5G. They're kind of like available now, but they're sometimes you know bandied about marketing wise with 5G. Those are actually really useful because now you can get a connection to a device, a cellular connection that has guaranteed sort of service for, you know, 25 cents a month, you know, something like that. I mean, the connection on our phones costs us $40 a month. So, you know, that's that's a couple orders of magnitude less. And that enables use cases for an enterprise if they need to know the location of a million things. Well, if you're only paying 25 cents a month, that's much better than paying $5 a month. It it makes it, it makes things, uh, you know, much more feasible. So here's a technical question then. How many of these 25 cents a month uh, uh, chips do I need to duct tape to my phone to get the same kind of service? Because I feel like I can add in a ton of them and I'll just you know have a nice big phone. <laughs> yeah, you'll, you'll have one of those old brick phones. Like you know, if you go back and watch uh, Miami Vice or one of those older 80s, late 80s, early 90s shows, you, that's kind of what, that's how many of them you'd have to put together to get up to a gig. There's a lot of stacking there. Uh, bold of you to assume <laughs> I don't want that already. <laughs> right. <laughs> 
um, I, so as we wrap up here, I wanted to ask you all kind of one very big kind of broad question as we were kind of now into 2021, but, and that is just your general predictions for the year. What are you most excited for? What do you think is going to happen? What do you hope happens? Uh, maybe on the side, same conversation, what do you hope does not happen that maybe you've heard may happen? Um, and just kind of get your overall thoughts there. All right, I'll go first. I'll, I'll leave the conclusion, uh, the cleanup batter to Ken. Um, so th- th- I think the most important thing for, for all industries, including IoT, is a vaccine. <laughs> so, so what am I hoping for in 2021? I'm hoping everyone can get vaccinated as soon as possible so the world can get back to a more normality. Um, in the IoT space in particular, um, we're extremely excited. Um, the, you know, the, the pandemic has been very difficult on everyone in different ways, some people more than others, right? For sure. But one of the things that it's really shown to the world and to all our potential business customers is if you can't remotely monitor and operate your business at some level, you're going to be in a really tough spot. So you you have a lot of executives now that just like me, (laughs) don't go into the office anymore, haven't for 10 months. And they're sort of trying to understand what their business is doing day to day through a zoom window or something like, so it's, and you can do that with people because you can make them come to the camera and turn it on. And you assuming they're not elementary school kids, <laughs> things like that. But, um, you know, how do you know what's going on in your business? How do you know what's going on in your office building? You maybe have a, a gigantic office complex. How do you know what's happening there? You know, how do you know there's not leaks? How do you know you're not expending energy that there's not, you know, a fire hazard? You, you don't know because there's no one there. Right. So, so there's really, um, a big, big, uh, growth in interest of using, IOT to sort of digitally transform all businesses. So the pandemic just put that on steroids and really got that message across to everyone if they were a little reticent about digitally transforming the business. And on the other side is you look at the large tech companies and how they're basically just gobbling up entire industries because they're they're playing at a from a position of strength because they're already digitally native companies and they're able to go in to tr- more traditional brick and mortar or whatever it may be and they their cost containment their ability to innovate is just there from day one and they just can undercut prices and essentially eliminate very you know big players from from huge markets right and just take over those markets so from a competitive standpoint not only from a convenience and just ability to operate more efficiently but from a competitive standpoint, I think every business is going to have to digitally transform and IoT is going to play a major role in that. So at Leverage, we're very, very excited about that. But until the country and the world can really truly open up and supply chains get back to normal and everything else, um, it's going to be bumpy because the recovery is just not there. The demand's not going to be there, but everyone's excited about doing it. So we're all kind of waiting on the vaccine. Uh, and then it's just going to be, you know, go 110 miles an hour. Uh, I do not disagree with any of that. Uh, so I suppose I could just end there, but, uh, it, it, I actually can't. I don't think it's possible for me to not say a thing. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to sort of reframe the question and say an answer instead. What does IoT have in store for 2021? Because I think that that I'm not willing to predict what the uh, the next year has in store for us. But I think that what IoT is going to be able to offer as an industry is uh, a lot of the things that we learned last year as an industry, how to do are going to become standard practice because they made sense. Uh, things like remote work is going to become much more common. I think now that people have been doing it for nine months and companies are going to go, Oh, I, I guess I don't need to walk around my office and look at people working. I, I they're, they're working, they're doing their thing. And so I think that's going to have an impact on like commercial real estate markets, for instance, and perhaps, uh, uh, commuter traffic and, and things like that might all become very different, uh, over the next year that folks are going to have to learn about and, and adjust to, I think that, um, supply chain tracking, asset tracking, uh, cold chain, all of those things, which have been growing and becoming more and more sophisticated for the last several years, uh, got a big shot in the arm in 2020 and are going to continue to do that in 2021. And I think uh, the next step 
once those implementations that are underway have become fully sort of put in place is more automation is is getting the uh the a into the iot in those in those situations so that's sort of the the broad things that i think are coming and generally i see all that as good stuff i think that the that the world is better for it and uh we're going to find not just business efficiencies but sort of sustainable solutions and and uh global efficiencies that are going to help with a lot of uh sort of uh, unintended consequences things yeah that's great i appreciate both those insights and to kind of the last question i have is is aimed at eric um just kind of how we usually wrap up most of our episodes is on the lever side what what are you most excited about or anything out there that the audience should be on the lookout for and then on top of that if they have any follow-up questions want to connect with you what's the best way to do so yeah, so um, you know, we're excited. This is more of an internal thing, but we've been working. Uh, we've basically been spending a lot of our time <laughs> that while during the pandemic when our customers weren't weren't answering their phones in some cases. Um, you know, working, investing in our technology. So uh, we've we've spent nine months um, basically building the next version of our platform to help customers do things even better, faster, and more maintainably. And so we're launching that this this quarter. Actually, um, some early customers. Um, so we're very excited about that product launch. It's a major upgrade to how our our platform worked, uh, which will enable our customers to do things better. Um, and then we have you know we have a couple things. I can't mention them right now, but we have a couple large partnerships that are in the works that uh, we'll be announcing at some major virtual conferences uh, here in the next uh, two months um, and products and solutions that we're, uh, we're working with partners on that will be launched. Um, but yeah, we're asset tracking, as uh, Ken said, is one of our major focuses, low cost asset tracking. Um, and we just see that getting a, you know, a big, big uh, boost uh, coming out of the pandemic. Um, and we're, we're, we're primed uh, to help solve a lot of those problems for, for certain classes of businesses. Fantastic. Well, we look forward to seeing more coming out of leverage and I want to thank you both for your time being on the 100th episode of the IT for all podcast and hope you enjoy the rest of your week and look forward to having you back on and Ken, good luck with your show. I think our audience is going to love it. We'll make sure we kind of cross promote it over here as well. Um, and, um, for our audience's sake, you know, welcome, welcome to the team. I think we're all excited to have you and uh, thanks again for your time guys. Uh, all right. You. Really appreciate it. And to you folks out there listening, uh, I know you love, uh, the IOT for all podcast. I know you love Ryan as your host, but if you want to come over to let's connect, that's okay. You're welcome there. You can listen to both if you want, but you know, uh, do what your heart says. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you guys. All right. Bye. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks again for joining us this week on the IoT for All podcast. I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please leave us a rating or review and be sure to subscribe to our podcast on whichever platform you're listening to us on. Also, if you have a guest you'd like to see on the show, please drop us a note at ryan at iotforall.com and we'll do everything we can to get them as a featured guest. Other than that, thanks again for listening and we'll see you next time.